Software development is a commercially important activity. Most modern businesses are, to a large extent, software driven, even if we don't always think of them in that way. So wasting time and money on it is a really bad idea. And yet many, maybe most organizations do things that end up doing both of these. So here are five extremely common ways in which organizations waste time, money and effort in software development. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. There has always been a tension between two groups in software development, the planners and the explorers. The planners believe that the secret to success is to plan in enough detail and with enough accuracy to know what to do and when to do it. The explorers, and I'm firmly in that camp, believe that software development is a lot more complicated than that. And so instead it depends on a process of continual exploration, learning and discovery. And so the secret to successful software development is to optimize to be really good at that process of learning and discovery. I think that this big difference in perspective underpins the waste that is so often common in software development. Pick the wrong viewpoint and you end up doing the wrong things. In this episode, I want to talk about five problems that will lead you to spend more time, money and effort than you need to when building even very complex software systems. The first of my five is not building what users want. Spending time and effort building stuff that no one wants is clearly a waste. But in practice, it isn't at all easy to know what the right things to build are. Microsoft did a study of their own product decision making. They came to the conclusion that two thirds of their ideas made zero or negative contribution to Microsoft's aims. That is, two thirds of their ideas were bad ideas. Other research says it is actually quite a lot worse than that. At two thirds of the ideas at Microsoft being bad, they're actually doing rather well and a lot better than most organizations. This research says that for most software projects, 80% of features are rarely or never used at all. So if it really is as bad as this, then we're all in danger of wasting huge amounts of time on building features that no one cares about. However sure we are that we have a killer idea and that we really do understand our customers and users and so know how to make them happy, however much effort we spend on market research and talking to customers, the data says that even when we ask them to tell us what they want, they don't really know the answer to that question either. This is doubly true if we're doing anything at all innovative. As Steve Jobs famously said, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. The data says that we're fooling ourselves. We don't really know if our customers like our ideas until we try them out and they get to see them. This is just as true of any product there are always more failures than there are successes. The difference in software is that we should have an advantage because software is a lot easier to change than physical things. At least it should be as long as we build it in ways that keep it easy to change. Let me pause there and thank our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, Tuple and Honeycomb. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the kinds of ideas and techniques that we discuss on this channel all of the time to build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Tuple builds software to make pair programming easier for people who work remotely and Honeycomb help engineering teams deeply understand their own production systems through observability with their tools. All these companies offer products and services that are very well aligned indeed with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, click on the links in the description below and do check them out. 
So if so many of our ideas are bad ideas, then we need to optimize our development process to allow us to have lots of ideas and identify the bad ones as early as possible so that we can discard them and stop wasting our time on them. We need fast feedback. And ideally, we need to get our ideas into the hands of real users as early in the life of the idea as we can to see if it's bad or good. And then learn how we might improve on the good ones and try something different for, to the bad ones. If you'd like to learn more about how to get that better feedback and to learn faster, do check out our free tutorial on continuous delivery. There's a link in the description below. The next big waste of time and money is big teams. It's been known since at least the early 1970s that big teams don't work for software development. As Fred Brooks famously said, nine women can't make a baby in a month. Software development is a complex creative process, yet we still see usually big organizations falling into this trap of throwing armies of people at a problem. I love this internal memo from Thomas J. Watson, once CEO of IBM complaining and asking about how the comparatively tiny Cray Computers team could have beaten the mighty IBM with their vast resources to producing the world's best supercomputer. Seymour Cray's observation on seeing a copy of this memo, it was that I think Mr. Watson has answered his own question. Small teams simply work better than big teams, dramatically better. The Team Topologies book advocates for teams sizes of eight people or fewer. My favourite research on this topic is a metadata analysis of over 4,000 software projects. They divided them up into two groups, those with a team size of 20 or more and those with five or fewer. Then they measured how long it took each team to reach 100,000 lines of code. Counting lines of code is a terrible metric for productivity, but it is easy data to collect and it certainly says something about the rate of development. On average, over all of the teams, it took nine months to produce 100,000 lines of code. Teams of 20 people or more, on average, got to 100,000 lines faster than the smaller teams, as you might expect. But they only beat those smaller teams by less than a week over that nine month period. So person for person, a team of five people is nearly four times more productive than a team of 20. And when you look at the quality of the work they produce, the 20 person teams created five times as many defects as the smaller teams. So you can be pretty certain that the next 100,000 lines of code would have taken them a lot longer. Because now, as well as writing all that new code, they'd also have to spend time fixing all of the bugs that they introduced in the first poor code. If you'd like to learn how to better organize things with small teams, I recommend that you read the Team Topologies book. There's lots of valuable content there. Next in my list of five though, is delaying feedback, working in big steps. Delaying feedback is costly because it's risky. Working in smaller steps gives us more opportunities to learn and more feedback on whether or not we're on the right track. But maybe even more important than that, working in smaller steps reduces the risks and so gives us the freedom to make mistakes and to recover from them more easily. If I work for three minutes or 30 minutes before finding out that my changes are wrong, the worst that can happen is that I wasted three or 30 minutes and have learned what not to do next time. If I've worked for three or 30 days, I've lost all that work and now I'm seriously behind schedule and I can't remember all of the things that I did over that period of time. So it would be much more difficult to correct and reproduce all of that wasted work, but with the problems fixed. As a result, I'll now be under lots of pressure to rush to get whatever I need to do next and get what I'm doing now into shape. Now I'm more likely to rush and cut corners and so even less likely to do a good job. Working in smaller steps and validating our work after each small step via continuous integration gives us more clarity and keeps our software in a working state for more of the time. It's an all around win for everyone. Next in my list of five is chasing features over quality. This is an incredibly common mistake. In fact, I guess based on my experience as a consultant, that chasing features like this is probably the most common organizational strategy for software development. Most orgs appear to do to organize their work to ensure that everyone's always busy, 
rather than for maximizing production. These are not the same thing at all. You can think of this from the perspective of queuing theory. Think of the list of features as existing as a queue of work to be done. How do you maximize the throughput of a queue like that? Maybe we should optimize to have nothing at all in the queue. Clearly that isn't going to maximize our throughput. So maybe we should organize things to make sure that the queue's always full. That's what we're doing when we prioritize feature production over everything else. We're keeping the queue always full. The problem with this is that it leaves no room for urgent work, things that need to jump the, the queue. And even worse, it applies pressure on those of us servicing the queue to cut corners again, because we're being measured on the rate at which we process features. So we end up producing poor quality work. The problem with this is that increasing and maintaining effective high volume feature production is a marathon and not a sprint. We need to allow space to do work that isn't directly related to for the features. Work that helps us to maintain or even increase the pace at which we can do new things. This sort of work is a lot more valuable than work that only focuses on features and makes us go slower and slower. Which is exactly what happens when we do low quality work. We need to keep our systems tidy and maintain them as a good place to do work. We need to verify that the features that we build work and continue to work and lots of other things that help us to do a good job. If we don't focus on the quality of what we build, it becomes more and more difficult to add new features and we end up going slower and slower, sometimes until we stop altogether. We must tend the systems that we build. It's naive nonsense to only prioritize features, but I'm afraid that it's a very common form of naive nonsense. Last in my list is manual regression testing. Manual testing certainly has a place in software development, but that place isn't regression testing. Human beings are wonderfully creative and inventive. We want them to make the most of that when they test our systems. Exploring them and taking a much more subjective view of their quality and utility. So what do we usually do? We demand that they do the same things for every release to check that the system is working properly. Sometimes we even produce test scripts for humans to follow, treating them rather like parts in a machine. This is not only slow and inefficient, but it's also low quality and a misuse of human skills and talents. Humans aren't good at being that repeatable. Machines are wonderful at fast, precise repetition, so we should use them for that and humans for the more creative work. Regression testing or regression testing should be done by machines via automated tests. This has lots of positive outcomes. It means that we can run these tests as often as we like, and if you're sensible, that means that we run them continuously, or at least every time we change anything. But what it takes to make useful, repeatable tests is that we need them to work in controlled circumstances, where the results of our test can be deterministic within the scope of the test. This encourages us to make design choices that not only result in more testable systems, but also generally better design systems as well. It's difficult to build testable systems without they are modular and cohesive with good separation of concerns, clean lines of abstraction between the parts of the system and all minimal, minimally coupled with each other. These things are not only what it takes to make our systems testable, these are not just optional extras, these things are also the hallmarks of high quality systems and code. Organizations often resort to manual testing because they think of their systems as non-deterministic, and whole large systems can indeed be that. But this is just a fact about any complex system. But it doesn't mean that we can't test it. It means that we need to design things to make them more easily testable. That includes designing things in ways that allow us to control the variables during the scope of a test, so that we can measure the things that we need to measure and get the same results every time. This is just as true for non-software systems as for software, but it's usually considerably easier for software because it's so malleable. So let's not abdicate our responsibility to make our systems testable. Let's not aim to throw the problem of testing over the wall to armies of manual testers. As Deming famously said, you can't inspect quality into a product. It must be built into it. 
If you avoid these five pitfalls, you will already be doing a considerably better job than most organisations. And almost certainly, you'll be a lot more productive, be having more fun doing it, and probably making more money with your software products too. Thank you very much for watching. And thanks too to our Patreon supporters for your support of the channel. It helps us to make this kind of content. If you're interested in joining as a Patreon member, please do check the links in the description below and check out all of the extremely useful extras that you get as a member. Thank you and bye-bye.